Good evening, everyone. My name is Jeremy Thomas, and I'm a director of the London Shipping Law Centre. It's my pleasure to welcome you all this evening to the 11th in the series of lockdown webinars organised under the auspices of the London Shipping Law Centre. Some 450 of you from 34 different countries have registered to participate in this webinar. And I trust your faith in the preeminence of London as the Maritime Dispute Resolution Centre will be reaffirmed by this evening's seminar. The subject matter of which is a historical analysis and commentary on the recent judgment of His Honour Mr Justice Andrew Baker in the eternal bliss on the long-standing question as to the availability of damages where a ship is on demurrage. We are particularly fortunate in having the Right Honourable Sir Richard Aikens on board, who has kindly offered to chair this event. He will require little introduction, I feel sure, but please allow me to remind you. Sir Richard was formerly a judge of the Court of Appeal and now works as an international arbitrator dealing with commercial cases. He is one of the joint authors of the newly published third edition of Bills of Lading and is also an editor of what is perhaps one of the most intellectually stimulating law books, namely Dicey, Morris and Collins. He's a visiting professor at King's College London and Queen Mary's University of London. I will leave it to him to introduce you to our distinguished panel of speakers to whom you'll be able to address your questions that you may wish to raise, a selection of which will be passed to our panelists for a 15 minute Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce the Right Honourable Sir Richard Aikens. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this webinar. It's my great pleasure and indeed honour to be chairing this evening's session. We have four distinguished speakers to deal with this question. And if I can put it in a nutshell, it seems to me the question is this. When are liquidated damages for detention of a vessel beyond her lay days, viz. demurrage, not liquidated damages? When can you get a bit more, in other words? Well, that's the question that Mr. Justice Andrew Baker had to look at in the case we're going to discuss, the eternal bliss. And he discussed it in some considerable detail. Well, to help us through his judgment and the background to it, the cases, the case law, and the various academic views on the matter, we have, first of all, Christopher Smith QC. Christopher practices from Essex Court Chambers, which needs no introduction to any of you, nor indeed does he. He specializes in shipping law. He is one of the current editors of Scrutton. So without more ado, over to you, Chris. Thank you very much, uh, Sir Richard. Good afternoon uh, to everybody in the audience. Um, when I was first putting my slide pack together, for this evening, I thought I might include a picture of the ship on the title page, as I sometimes do. So I put the words eternal bliss into my search engine. And normally that turns up some good pictures of the ship in question. But on this occasion, it turned up, first of all, 20 or more different articles written by law firms, barristers, chambers and P&I clubs about this case. Um, uh, they had two things in common. Firstly, they nearly all included some terrible puns around the words eternal and bliss and how good the result was for owners. And secondly, none of them, so far as I can remember, offered a view on whether they thought the decision was correct or not. So I'm going to try and avoid both of those pitfalls 
Um, no puns about eternal and bliss. And I will at the end of my talk stick my neck out um, somewhat and offer a view on the judgment. But starting off uh, with the question, as Sir Richard put it, I think it's necessary to go back to first principles. So if we could turn up the next slide, please. Before we get into the shipping books, I've delved into McGregor on damages, just for some a reminder about what we mean by damages. And that's an award of money for a civil wrong. Or to put a little more detail on that, the sum of money which will put the party who's been injured or who's had suffered in the same position as he would have been in if he had not sustained the wrong for which he's getting his compensation or reparation. So that's dim, um, damages. And then the next slide, please. Looking then at de Murridge, I'm going to take the words of Lord Brandon from a case called The Lips, which Mr Justice Andrew Baker referred to in The Eternal Bliss. De Murridge is a liability and damages to which a charterer becomes subject because by detaining the ship beyond the stipulated lay days, he is in breach of contract. Most, if not all, voyage charters contain a demurrage clause, which prescribes a daily rate at which damages for such detention are to be quantified. The effect of such a clause is to liquidate the damages payable. So next slide, please. Now, um, liquidated damages is a subject that's uh, well known in many other areas of law, apart from shipping law. And McGregor on damages at chapter 16 has an entire chapter to do with liquidated damages, nearly every single paragraph of which is concerned with the question of when the guilty party can get away with paying less than the liquidated damages because they say the liquidated damages clause is a penalty. But there are tucked away in that chapter three, I think, sections dealing with the question we are looking at which is when the innocent party can get more than the liquidated damages. So the claimant will, however, be entitled to sue for unliquidated damages in the ordinary way, in addition for suing for the liquidated damages, if other breaches have occurred outside those which fall within the liquidated damage provision, or, and this is our case, it seems if only part of the loss arising from a single breach is regarded as falling within the provisions ambit. And then there's two other quotes there, I shan't read them to you, but dealing with the same issue. So next slide, please. In his judgment in the eternal bliss, Mr. Justice Andrew Baker identified in a grid at paragraph 39 of the judgment, four different scenarios. The first is separate breach and a claim for something other than detention of the vessel. And that's the paradigm case in which recovery is possible. Next, no separate breach and no claim other than for detention of the vessel. And that's the paradigm case in which a recovery is not possible. Third, a separate breach, but no claim other than detention. And the box there was filled in recovery not possible on the basis of a decision of Lord Justice Scrutton called Invocate. Um, I would tentatively suggest that's been put a little bit too widely uh, by Mr. And Justice Andrew Baker in that box for the reason we looked at um, in the McGregor case a, 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 a citation a moment ago, that it may well be that the breach is outside the demurrage regime in any case, but that's not tonight's issue. The fourth point, no separate breach and a claim other than for detention. And that's the issue that we are concerned with. So next slide, please. So the assumed facts in the eternal uh, bliss, and these were assumed facts for the purposes of an application to the court, were that there was a charter party on Norgrain terms for discharge in China. In fact, there was a, a longer term charter um, a contract for freightment, but for these purposes, treat this voyage as a, a single voyage on Norgrain terms. The discharge rate in clause 18 was 8,000 metric tons per weather working day. And the demurrage provision was in clause 19. Demurrage at loading and or discharge ports, if incurred, declared by owners upon vessel nomination, maximum $20,000 a day or pro rata, any time lost for which the charterers stroke receivers are responsible, which is not accepted under this charter party, shall count as lay time until the same has expired, thence time on demurrage. Well, the vessel was delayed at anchorage for 31 days and the cargo was damaged as a result of the delay. Remember, that's an assumed fact. 
and a claim brought by the receivers against the owners was settled and again assumed to have been settled on reasonable terms. So next slide please. And that uh, gives rise to two uh, main points of principle identified by Mr Justice Andrew Baker. What is it that the demurrage liquidates and in respect of what does demurrage calculated in accordance with the voyage charter fix and therefore limit the owner's recovery? Next slide please. As uh, Mr Justice Andrew Baker said, just going back to uh, McGregor, it seems that if only part of the loss arising from a single breach is regarded as falling within the provisions ambit, the claim is not restricted. And McGregor illustrates that by reference to a case called Rydar and Arcos. And that's one dealt with also, if we look at the next slide, please, in the books, uh, uh, the particularly the shipping law books. So paragraph 15006 of Scrutton, um, not I hasten to add one of the chapters that um, I am responsible for, where there is no further breach of charter beyond the failure to load or discharge within the lay days, but the charter's breach causes the ship owner damage in addition to the detention of the ship, the position is not clear, but it is submitted that the better interpretation of RIDAR and ARCOS is that these losses can be recovered. So that was, as Mr Justice Andrew Baker said, clearly in favour of the owners. But as we see on the next slide, voyage charters at paragraph 1614 swings the other way. The varying reasoning of the members of the Court of Appeal and RIDAR in Arcos left in doubt whether, if damages in addition to the marriage are to be recovered, it is necessary to show a breach of a separate obligation as well as damage of a separate kind from the delay. In Suisse Atlantique, both Mokatage and the Court of Appeal took the view that it was necessary to show a separate breach, which it is submitted is the better view. So therein lies the conundrum. Um, so I'm going to go on now to look in the next slide, please, at RIDAR and ARCOS. Uh, the vessel there arrived at her load port in early October. That was in good time, all going well, to load a full and complete cargo for carriage to Manchester. But it was October, and if there was any delay in the loading, it would mean that the vessel could only load a winter deck cargo, not a summer deck cargo. So in summer, she was entitled to load 850 standards of sawn timber, but in winter, it was only 544 standards. So she failed to load within um, her specified rate and the vessel went on to demurrage. There was no dispute about the claim for demurrage, but she also loaded only the 544 standards. So the owners bought a claim for dead freight in addition to the demurrage. The claim was distinctly pleaded as a claim for breach of the obligation to load a full and complete cargo. The defence was that when the vessel sailed, she had a full and complete cargo. She was not lawfully entitled to carry to the United Kingdom under the provisions of the Merchant Shipping Act any more cargo over and above the 544 standards. So we need to look at the judgments and the way the judges approached it because as Scrutton and Voyage Charters say, uh, it's not easy to discern a clear ratio from the three judgments. So. First of all, in the next slide, please, Lord Justice Banks. He quite clearly held that there was no breach of the obligation to load a full and complete cargo. Essentially, he held that the loss was caused by a breach of the obligation to load at the agreed rate, because when the vessel finished loading, she had loaded a full and complete cargo as much as she was lawfully entitled to load. And the claim for demurrage, however, did not exclude the additional claim for any special damage because the claim advanced for the dead freight was quote essentially distinct from any claim for the detention of the vessel. So Lord Justice Banks is clearly a one breach man. Uh, even though there's a single breach, if your loss is of a different nature, you can recover it. Uh, contrast in the next slide, clearly the other way, Lord Justice Sargent. He held that the time at which you had to assess whether a full cargo had been loaded, that had to be ascertained by reference to the time when the charterers received the ship for loading. And when she arrived at the load port, she could still have loaded a full summer cargo. Our Lord Justice Sergeant went on to say the demurrage provisions of Clause 3 did not form an agreed compensation for the loss which the owners has suffered. That's the a loss of freight. That was loss of another character, namely loss of freight caused by the breach by the charterers, their contract to load a full and complete cargo. So he's identifying two breaches and a separate loss 
and the owner was entitled to recover in respect to the separate loss. So the confusion arises um, with the greatest respect from the third judgment, the judgment on the next page, please, of Lord Justice Atkin. The breach he held was a breach of the obligation to load a complete cargo within the lay days. So he's essentially, in one sense, merged the two different breaches uh, that Lord Justice Sargent identified. But, Lord Justice Atkin said, the provisions as to demurrage quantify the damages not for the complete breach, but only such damage as arise from the detention of the vessel. So where the charterers fail to do what he agreed to do, that's load a full and complete cargo, the owner may recover the loss he's incurred in addition to his liquidated damages. There was a complete cargo at the date of sailing, uh, Lord Justice Atkins said, but less than a complete cargo if the loading had been completed on time. So next slide, please. Um, Mr. Justice Andrew Baker um, considered the judgments in uh, Rydar and Arcos. He was, in my view, right to conclude that if uh, the judgments of all three Lord Justices had been uh, along the lines of Lord Justice Banks' judgment, that would have been binding in favour of the owners in eternal bliss, but that was clearly not the case. Um, Mr Justice Andrew Baker concluded that uh, Lord Justice Atkin was a two-breach man, that he was with Lord Justice Sargent, and I'll come back to that in a moment. But assuming that was correct, uh, Mr Justice Andrew Baker also concluded that if Rydar v Arcos was a two-breach case, nonetheless it didn't decide the point in the eternal bliss against the owners. And that's because neither Lord Justice Sargent nor Lord Justice Atkin said that Lord Justice Banks was wrong on this point. So essentially it left open, even if the majority decision was based on two breaches, it left open that one breach different damages was enough. So next slide please, that gives rise to two questions. Firstly, was Mr Justice Andrew Baker right to conclude? Um, and in this sense, he was agreeing with uh, Mr Justice Potter in the bond, which other speakers will come on to, that Lord Justice Atkin agreed with Lord Justice Sargent, that's two breaches, rather than with Lord Justice Banks. And in any event, and this is perhaps the bigger question, was Mr Justice Andrew Baker right to conclude, in the light of all the other authorities that other speakers will look at, that one breach was enough? if there was a claim other than for detention. And so, uh, last slide please, uh, this is where I stick my neck out on the first question, with respect, arguably not. And this perhaps underlies the quote from Scrutton that we looked at earlier. Um, in my view, looking at uh, Lord Justice Atkins' judgment, he was more of a one-breach man than a two-breach man. Um, therefore, Rydar v Arcos is authority for the fact that one breach but different loss is enough. But on the bigger question, did Mr Justice Andrew Baker get it right? Overall, in my view, yes, although not necessarily for the reasons he gives. The key reason seems to me that if you look at Clause 18 and Clause 19 that we looked at earlier, the real key to the case is that the claim that was bought for an indemnity in respect of losses paid to the receivers is not a claim in respect of, quote, any time lost. And that simply means that as a matter of construction, Clause that 19 was not engaged and the uh, demurrage provisions uh, did not apply um, in the circumstances of this case. So um, I wait to be told that I'm wrong by the Court of Appeal. Um, I hope that's been a useful introduction. And I know Robert is now, no, sorry, Daryl is now going to go on and look at some of the other cases that uh, Mr. Justice Andrew Baker looked at. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Chris. Uh, that is a splendid introduction to the difficulties and the complications that there are there. And to take us on from there, we have next Daryl Kennard, who is a partner in Pennington's, and he is in the marine trade and energy team of that firm. He engages in both wet and dry shipping work in a thoroughly international way and is also a supporting member of the LMAA. Well now, Daryl, do you support Mr Justice Andrew Baker or do you not? Over to you. I've always been a great supporter of Mr Justice Andrew Baker, um, but I will keep my powder dry um, as I am involved in this case. Um, uh, but I think my task today is to take you through Swiss Atlantique. 
Next slide, please. Uh, and look at what their judgments say. So the critical question was, um, I suppose, at first instance, was Mr. Justice Baker free of authority? Uh, that's not a relevant question before uh, the Court of Appeal. Uh, but it, in uh, the eternal bliss, Mr. Justice Baker concluded that the language in Swiss Atlantic uh, in, in the House of Lords suggested their lordships had in mind that the marriage only covered a certain type of loss flowing from the detention of the vessel. Uh, he, they, they also looked at, uh, as you've heard, uh, whether in the Radar and Arcos in the Court of Appeal, the appeal was only allowed because a separate breach had been identified. Um, and of course, the critical question is whether Banks's judgment, which was a one breach, different type of harm uh, theory, whether that formed part of the ratio of Rydar and Arcos. Next slide, please. So what are the facts of Swiss Atlantic? Of course, we all know this because of fundamental breach and that being jettisoned. Um, but for that, perhaps the case would have been known as the General Guisan, which was contracted to perform consecutive voyages over two period, a uh, two year period. And of course it contained uh, lay time and demurrage provisions. So in other words, it's, it's a, a single vessel effectively performing a contract for freightment, but shuttling back and forth for, for two years. There were delays over the period of those two years in loading and discharging the vessel. And in consequence of those delays, only eight round voyages could be performed in the two years. Uh, and the owners said that if there had been no such delays uh, uh, and breaches of the lay day provisions, then another six more voyages could have been completed. And if those six more voyages had been completed, then they would have earned more freight. Um, and the contract, it's historically in, um, interesting to note, was fixed when the freight rates were high following the blocking of the Suez Canal in November 1956. They then fell back after it was reopened uh, so, of course, that meant the charters could go into the, uh, into the open market and get uh, uh, lower freight rates. But in contrast, in the contract, the demurrage rates uh, remain low. Next slide, please. So notwithstanding demurrage had been paid, owners sued for loss of earnings due to the delays resulting in the reduced voyages. The claim was advanced in four ways. Uh, the first two were construction issues. The third was an implied term. None of those need concern us today. And the fourth basis uh, was an argument that damages for more than mere detention, i.e. more than the mere loss of the use of the vessel as a freight earning instrument uh, for breach of the obligation to load and discharge within laid time uh, was allowed per banks in Radar and Arcos. Next slide, please. Uh, so the legal debate. Uh, there's only one breach uh, for which demurrage was payable and paid. Since the demurrage rate customarily assessed by reference to the prevailing market rate, should it be construed as liquidated damages for detention as a type of loss, i.e. loss of use of the vessel as a freight earning asset, or all types of losses arising from detention being a breach of the obligation to load and discharge within lay time. Next slide, please. Uh, it, the case came before Makata at first instance uh, in Swiss Atlantic, and having identified the issues in competing submissions, he observed the relevance of owners' first three submissions, those of course are the failed bases, is that if any of them be right, he's established an obligation on the charter as different from or in addition to that imposed on them by the application of the lay time provisions, and thus may be afforded a means of recovering damages and other than demurrage. Uh, Mr. Justice Baker tackled this observation head on and said that a means in that sentence means one means, not the only available means. Uh, but what was the focus of Makata's judgment as a whole? Next slide, please. Well, with the first three bases having failed, Makata summarized the only arguments before him. The owners were arguing that demurrage only covered detention and since their claim was for loss of freight, it was recoverable per banks in Radar and Arcos because they said it was distinct from detention. Uh, in contrast, the charters argued that there was only one breach, uh, the, no, the obligation to load and discharge and the fixed times provided, and only one loss, 
In other words, the loss of freight, so called, was in fact no more than detention. And that was, and Demarish was the only remedy. So the, the point there is that there's no detailed argument before McCatter, it would seem, on whether Banks's approach of one breach separate harm um, was correct. And in consequence of this, McCatter's judgment doesn't really deal in any detail with Banks's judgment. Next slide, please. So the case, uh, so given the, uh, uh, sorry, I think I've covered that point. So let's, let, next slide, please. Um, so the case went up to the Court of Appeal uh, and Sellers J. L. J. said, I do not find that Radar and Arcos case supports the argument, which is advanced here, that there is some damage to be assessed on a separate ground or as a separate head by reason of the detention of the vessel. Uh, of course, here, the, word, the reference to the separate head has echoes of uh, Banks LJ's approach in the Court of Appeal. However, one has to just pause and think, what is Sellers LJ really saying? Is he saying anything other than whichever way you look at it, owner's claims failed because there was neither a separate breach of obligation nor a separate head of loss, Swiss Atlantic being one breach, one type of loss came. Next slide, please. Harmon LJ, his uh, speech reminds us that the chancery mends no, man, mends no man's bargain. If you have a bad contract, tough luck. He notes that the only breach of the bargain was to take longer than permitted to load and discharge, and then said, the breach did consist of taking longer, not on the voyage, but on discharging and loading the cargo. That is the only breach. It is a breach of detention. For breaches of that kind, the parties have entered into a conventional figure for damage, which is called demurrage. Next slide, please. Mr. Justice Baker construed that dicta as saying that Damages cannot be at large for a breach that consists solely of detention beyond lay days. And importantly, the type of harm resulting from that breach is central to the understanding of what demurrage covers. In other words, he appears to have placed reliance on the words of that kind in the sentence highlighted in green in order to understand what the phrase it is a breach of detention means and seems to be construing that short sentence as meaning it is a breach of the type causing detention. Uh, the question is whether that is in fact what uh, Harmon LJ was saying, or, or are the words at the beginning of that paragraph, the breach did consist of taking longer, uh, describing the type of breach, and is he then going on to summarizing that as shorthand and saying it's a breach of detention? Next slide, please. Uh, Lord Justice Ditlock uh, also gave a speech. He said a charterer commits a breach, or sorry, he, he said it was established in Radar and Arcos that a charterer commits a breach of contract if he disowns the vessel beyond lay days, and that demurrage has liquidated damages for the detention involved. Question, detention involved means breach or type of harm. Lord Justice Ditlock then went on to say that it's not otherwise easy to discover the ratio of Radar and Arcos, before adding that was irrelevant. What happened as a result of the breaches was the, the vessel was detained. She could not be used as a freight earning instrument, and that is all. For that head of damage, the parties have agreed, perhaps wisely or unwisely, the figure the defaulting charter shall pay. Uh, Baker said the predominant focus here was on the type of loss, um, not the type of breach. Uh, I think the only observation to make is, of course, that Diplock had started all of this saying that radar and Arcos wasn't easy to understand and you can't identify the ratio easily. Next slide, please. Uh, Baker, Jay and the Eternal Bliss said of the uh, uh, Swiss Atlantic when they went up to the House of Lords that there is in the speeches a certain focus on the type of loss intended to be liquidated by demurrage. What their lordship said about the nature of demurrage does not amount to any conclusion that a separate breach of contract is necessary in order to, uh, to claim unliquidated damages for losses other than loss of use. Next slide, please. So let's look at what they said in the House of Lords. By Count Dillhorn, if in this case the appellants had been able to establish a breach of the charter other than by detention of the vessel, then Rydar and Arcos is authority for saying that damages obtainable would not be limited to demurrage payments. In my opinion, they've not done so. 
Baker suggested that the reference here to breach of the charter party by the detention of the vessel has the same flame, flavor as Harmon's breach of detention. Uh, and he, which he'd have read, of course, as I've just described, explained as a breach of the type causing detention. Question though, is the better reading that detention is merely shorthand for the type of breach? Next slide, please. The following passage of uh, Vicar Dillenhorn is also noteworthy in that he appears to cite with approval Del Delvlin in Chandras and in Branson. Uh, in the circumstance of this case, it may be that the amount of demarrage payments bears little relation to the appellant's loss. In Chandras, Devlin said, the sum produced by demurrage is generally less than the damages for detention, and that a demurrage clause is merely a clause providing liquidated damages for a certain type of breach. So note the emphasis there on type of breach rather than type of harm. Next slide, please. Uh, next was Lord Hodson about Radar and Arcos. He said there was a separate breach from, uh, although arising from the same circumstances as the delay, and it was in these circumstances that damages were awarded. This statement appears to suggest that Lord Hodson thought a separate breach was needed because those were the circumstances that allowed for the recovery in Rydar and Arcos. If so, then it thought he appears, he, he appears to have thought that the bank's theory was not part of the ratio. Next slide, please. Lord Upjohn said there was only one breach by the charters namely a breach of the obligation to load and discharge at an agreed rate, and the detention of the ship in a port beyond that date was a breach of contract for which the parties had agreed damages. Baker said that in expressing what he understood to be covered by the demurrage rate, the language used is of a type of breach, but is characterized by a type of harm, namely the detention of the ship. But the word detention there, can also be understood to be referring to the breach rather than the type of harm caused. Next slide, please. So the difficulty was Swiss Atlantique. In Swiss Atlantique, there was no separate type of harm flowing from the breach of the lay time provisions. That being so, there was no direct engagement in the judgments with the bank's approach. So it's important to analyze carefully the context in which any of the statements made by the nine judges are made. Next slide, please. So what we're really looking at here is the question of whether since the demurrage rate is usually assessed by reference to the estimated commercial daily losses suffered when a vessel is detained, are the parties taken to have intended only to liquidated damages suffered for the loss of the use of the vessel as a freight earning asset, or is how the demurrage rate might have been arrived at irrelevant and should the usual broad application of the liquidated damages clause apply? Ordinarily absent a express provision to the contrary, the liquidated damages clause will cover all losses flowing from the breach to which it applies. Next slide, please. Ultimately, it's a question of construction. What does a commercial party uh, in 2021, as we are today, or 2000 and uh, whenever it was, 16, when the contract was concluded, understand by the phrase, demurrage is liquidated damages for detention. That's a phrase that will trip off any maritime lawyer's tongue fast when you ask to explain what demurrage is. But does it mean demurrage is liquidated damages for the loss of the use of the vessels of freight earning asset, or demurrage is liquidated damages for all losses arising from a breach of the obligation to load or discharge within lay time. Next slide, please. I'm gonna pass over now to Sir Richard. Thank you very much, Daryl, uh, for that. And uh, particularly the explanation of Swiss Atlantique, always a difficult case. Well, I hope you're keeping up in the maze. And to help us next, is Robert Gay. Now, Robert has form because he has written on this very issue in the Lloyd's Commercial and Maritime Law Quarterly back in 2004. And his article is referred to by Mr. Justice Baker at paragraph 27 of his judgment. 
We're grateful to Robert because he is the person who has put together this seminar for the LSLC this evening. Thank you very much indeed. He practices as a maritime arbitrator and has done since 2019. And now we will hear more uh, on his thoughts on this difficult topic. Robert. So ladies and gentlemen, what I'm not wanting to do is to rehash what I said 16 years ago. Uh, next, please. Um, I think that what Mr. Justice Andrew Baker held is right as a matter of English law, both in terms of the meaning of the word to the extent that we can fix on that, and in terms of the authority, or at least the authority that's going to be relevant in the Court of Appeal. I hope that in the limited time available, I may get on to talk about some of the issues that will arise inevitably if the Court of Appeal does uphold the judgment of Mr. Justice Andrew Baker in this case. Next, please. So, meaning the judge is perfect with great respect, entirely right to say this is a question about what's meant by the word demurrage. But I think the problem here is demurrage is not a word of ordinary English. And really, it's not a technical term of the ordinary shipping business. It's a technical term of shipping law. And so even when you're trying to get hold of the meaning, you're inevitably going to end up looking at judgments. Uh, next, please. Um, this is my version of the four scenarios. Um, the starting point is that under English law, the one thing that is clear is that sometimes the owners of a vessel under voyage charter can escape from the demurrage rate that they've agreed. The question is not whether they can, the question is in what circumstances and just how difficult escaping is. So my version of the four scenarios is these two ovals where the left hand one in red is you can escape if there's a breach of a separate obligation like the obligation to load a full cargo the right hand circle oval is you can escape if there's a separate type of loss the position in the judgment next before the eternal bliss, or rather next but one, the bond, is you need both of those. So it's in the intersection between the two ovals. And the fourth possibility is that either of them will do. And so if you're anywhere inside either of those two ovals, you as the owner can escape. Next slide, please. Under English law, the possibilities, the scenarios immediately get restricted. Under French law, as I understand it, or under quite a lot of New York arbitrators, depending, I think, on which side of the bed they got out of that day, you can have a breach of a separate obligation. And the result is that demurrage is no longer applicable the damages are at large, demurrage simply relates to the strict obligation to load or discharge within the lay time allowed. So as I understand French law, if you as the charterer, the vessel comes in to load and there's no cargo for her to load, then you're liable for damages at large. Demurrage only applies if the cargo is there and there's a delay in loading. But that was knocked on the head as far as English law is concerned by the Court of Appeal, which was unanimous in Inverkip, and the main speaker was Lord Justice Scrutton. It was precisely a case in which the owners said there was no cargo for the vessel in the port. And Scrutton says, well, any breach, whatever the obligation, where the result is delay within the loading or discharge stages, that delay is dealt with by demurrage. Next, please. So what's left of separate breach on its own is this, that the parties to a contract are free to agree what they want. They can agree to take a particular obligation 
outside the whole Laytime and Demurrage thing. This, one of my favorite little judgments, which is unreported, but in the footnotes to, Sco to Schofield on Laytime, is a case called the Lee Francis. The vessels chartered to discharge in Ireland and it's late December. And the contract says that provided the vessel is in all respects ready to discharge by 8 a.m. on the 22nd of December, the charterers undertake that she will be completed before the end of Christmas Eve. The late time was weather working days and obviously starting on the 25th of December, there were a lot of holidays. And the judge who was Mr. Justice Stain, as he then was, says by necessary implication, the parties intend this so-called guarantee to be outside the whole late time and demurrage thing. And it's that possibility that's left for separate breach, breach of a separate obligation on its own. Next, please. So I, when you're looking for the meaning of a word, I would suggest you might want to look at what judges say obiter rather than just at the ratio. And the reason for that is if a judge is speaking obiter, he may express his natural intuitions about the meaning of the words. If he's had half a day of argument each way on what this means, his natural intuitions are likely to have evaporated about lunchtime. And Mr. Justice Andrew Baker in The Eternal Bliss quotes from, I forget whether it's Lord Donaldson, Master of the Rolls or Mr. Justice Donaldson, but in my humble opinion, Donaldson is a good hunch person. What he says seems on the whole to make sense as a way of systematizing shipping law. So I think that's good value. And also, it seems to me on a fair reading of the Court of Appeal in Swiss Atlantic, Lord Justice Diplock is saying what's liquidated by, by demurrage is precisely that for the length of that period, the owners can't use the vessel to earn freight. Um, next, please, authority. So coming over to authority, the well, most important thing is, as has already been said, in the Court of Appeal, it doesn't matter whether Mr. Justice Andrew Baker was allowed to do what he did as a first instance judge. The only binding authorities in the Court of Appeal are Ryder and Arcos, about which I will not say any more, and Swiss Atlantique, which in a way is the one that really matters because if the House of Lords decided what the effect of Ryder and Arcos was, that interpretation of Ryder and Arcos is going to be binding. So we need to say a bit more about Swiss Atlantic. Next, please. In the House of Lords, the case was argued twice, and the second time it's about the doctrine of funda fundamental breach, which their lordships decided was a heresy and Lord Denning should be burnt at the stake. Um, it was argued before Makata, before the Court of Appeal, before the House of Lords the first time around as a case about damages in addition to demurrage. And as Daryl has said, in Swiss Atlantic, the real ratio is just the owner's only loss was the loss of the opportunity to earn freight on more voyages. And that's the sort of loss that is exactly liquidated by demurrage. But there's two or three more things to say, just as it were, to clear up Swiss Atlantic at least a bit. So next, please. Before Mr. Justice Mercato, there's a lot about separate breaches. And I think what's going on here is imagine that in that contract there had been an undertaking by the charterers to use reasonable endeavors to complete no less than say 15 voyages, then I would suggest that's the sort of thing that by necessary implication would be outside the whole late time and demurrage thing. If there had been that sort of obligation, the owners could certainly have got damages at large. That's why there's so much about separate breaches. Next, please. 
in the Court of Appeal, certainly Diplock is not in the business of rejecting what Lord Justice Banks says. He says, whichever of the ratios is right, either way, the owners can't win. Next, please. And in the House of Lords, if you look at the report in the appeal cases, the counsel for the charters first time round submits straight off that Banks was wrong. None of their lordships takes the opportunity to agree with that. And at least one of them says, well, whichever way you do it. Now that's not rejecting Banks. Next, please. So if we come to authority as consensus, the way higher courts pay attention to the position in lower courts, the real position is just that before the eternal bliss, there were a couple of judgments one way, there were a couple of judgments the other way. Although the judgments the other way, the Bond were and the Luxmar were the ones that Mr. Justice Andrew Baker disagreed with, everybody thought that it was just might be one way, might be the other way. And if we come down next, please, to persuasive authority, well, I think Lord Justice Banks is quite good value. Next, please. So I would have hoped to talk about these problems, but my time's up, ladies and gentlemen, so you might want to read the slides afterwards. Thank you very much indeed, Robert. Well, you've left us at a tantalizing point in the argument. Ladies and gentlemen, don't forget, we're here not only to listen to the distinguished speakers, but also to deal with any issues that you might have uh, to raise. So please don't be backwards in coming forward. Give us your questions and we'll do our best to try and answer them because these are difficult problems. And they're difficult problems, not just for ship owners and charterers, but possibly also for those who engage in the trades that use the ships in voyage charters. In other words, those involved in commodities. We all know that there are commodity contracts with standard terms which refer to demurrage, and we all know that there could be issues about whether or not other types of damages could be passed down the line. Well, here to help us with that problem, we have Anne Chazel, our last speaker. She is the group lead lawyer for Cargill's ocean transport business, and she is based in Geneva. Prior to her current position, she practiced as a solicitor in various leading London shipping firms. So no one better uh, to, than Anne to deal with these particular aspects. So over to you, Anne, but don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, please give us your questions if you have them. Thank you. I'm encouraged um, to hear Sir Richard describe this as difficult because I'm certainly finding it uh, less than straightforward. Um, so. Obviously, the decision in the eternal bliss has significant consequences for the voyage charterer, where he's at the end of a charter party chain, and his immediate reaction will probably to be to assess what are the prospects of passing a claim onto his counterparty under a sale uh, a contract. So what we're talking about here is an, a claim against FOB sellers for delays at the load port, or CIF buyers for delays at the discharge port. Um, I, sh I should say, as will become clear from my presentation, I think this question is potentially quite complicated or certainly capable of being made very complicated. And that, that may have a slightly paradoxical effect on the reaction of the market to what seems to us to be quite a seismic change. Um, in the law if the eternal bliss is, is good law. Um, and I'm going to talk about the commercial effect of that very shortly right at the end. Um, I, I should also say that it's likely that I'm going to be leaving you with uh, far more questions than, than I am answers. Uh, next slide, please. So 
Late on in the marriage provisions in a contract of sale uh, vary enormously, and they've been the subject of a fair amount of judicial consideration. What we may see is, for instance, here, a simple provision, demurrage payable as per charter party, which immediately leads us to the question of just how much of the charter party regime as to demurrage is incorporated into the charter party. Um, uh, or they range to much more complicated provisions, some of which plainly respond to previous judicial decisions. Uh, for example, GAFTA 41, provides that the demurrage rate shall be as per charter party, which is already a clarification. And um, it even helpfully goes on to say that if the ship's on time, time charter, it, it explains what your mechanism there is for calculating the equivalent to demurrage, which, is, um, which corrects an oversight that's defeated at least one claim in the past. So Benjamin tells us that late time and demurrage provisions can be construed as either an indemnity for the amount payable by the charterer to the ship owner or an independent and freestanding obligation imp imposing an obligation of dispatch in the loading or the discharge. Next slide please. Now there has of course been debate over a number of years as to the link between a lay time and demurrage clause in a sale contract and in a charter party. And whether when we're considering the effect of the clause in a sale contract, we should be guided by the principles established in charter party cases. So when looking at the question of whether liability can be passed on, I started to consider what does demurrage liquidate in a sale contract? Um, are there grounds to argue that it's not necessarily the, the same thing? Um, and that led me swiftly to the decision in the bond, which is, of course, a decision on demurrage and damages in a sale contract. The next slide, please. Now, I think it can be argued that in the bond, Mr. Justice Potter arrives at three propositions. The first one I've set out on the slide for the sake of completeness, but it's been dealt with at length uh, already. So we're going to pass over that and move to the second. Now, I think it's arguable that what he is saying is that lay time is not a real obligation in a sale contract. The sole purpose of incorporating the lay time provision is just to provide the mechanism for reimbursement of demurrage between a buyer and a seller. Um, and you see in the words from his judgment that I've, I've quoted here, he says it's a, an ancillary and limited purpose for the importation of the lay time provisions. And um, that is a reason for construing the buyer's right to demurrage as the sole remedy for breach. And note we have the word breach in inverted commas there for breach of the loading rate. Um, I'm going to come back to what I think uh, Mr. Justice Andrew Baker's response to that is in the eternal bliss. Uh, next slide. The next proposition I would argue for is that he says that demurrage works in the same way in a sale contract as it does in a charter party, such that what is liquidated is the same. Um, and we'll see here the import importation of a charter party regime into the sale of goods act regime is should carry with it the same restrictions which apply to the party's remedies so far as breach of the lay time and the loading provision is concerned. Next slide, please. Now, my view here, and it's just my view, is that Mr Justice Potter takes an approach which is much more broadly consistent with construing the lay time and demurrage provisions as an indemnity Whereas Mr. Justice Baker takes much more of an independent obligation approach. Um, in, in relation to the first, uh, the first statement on this slide, what he says is that the argument advanced by Mr. Havelock Adams in the bond is that a demurrage clause provides an estimate of the loss of the freight if the vessel's detained beyond the lay days and that it doesn't cover the separate and independent loss represented by the necessity to pay carrying charges. Um, and it seems 
as a general point, um, it seems to me that if we look at Mr. Justice Baker's comments, he finds support in his view that the bond was wrongly decided precisely because of the results of its application in a sale contract. And I think we can see that in, in the words towards the, the bottom of this slide. Um, and so it's for this reason, it's it, for the difference between the two approaches that I just wonder whether there is room for the waters to be mudded here and whether depending on how the individual clause is construed, there may be room for a difference of approach as to whether uh, damages that can be claimed. But uh, if we now move on to the next slide, and we assume that the effect of the eternal bliss is that a claim for damages can be passed down a sale contract chain, then we need to look at whether the provisions of that sale contract in themselves preclude that additional claim for damages being passed down. Now, in some sale contracts, the only damages contemplated will be basis uh, contract versus market. And in that case, it's clear that no damages can arise in, in any event. Um, in other contracts, I'm taking GAFTA 64 as an example. Um, the, the, it provides that damages shall uh, basically be contract versus market, but not limited to that and would also be those damages which would re result directly and naturally in the ordinary course of events from the breach. Now, that is very much the sort of language we see in limb one of Hadley and Baxendale, and, we'll see, um, and it's very standard in uh, standard sale contracts that the, uh, the drafting will go to some pains to very uh, expressly exclude damages for any kind of loss of profit or any kind of consequential loss. So given that we're within sort of Hadley and Baxendale territory, if we look at those kinds of damages which have been identified as being of the nature of a separate type of damages, um, which are listed on our next slide. Um, so the, the first one is damage to cargo, which is obviously uh, what happened on the assumed facts of the eternal bliss. Now, in that case, um, what we've got, obviously these, the eternal bliss, the, the facts are slightly unusual in, in the sense that we, we know what's happened here, right? So the, the owners have chartered their ship to a voyage charterer, who is also, um, presumably a SIF seller, the buyer or the ultimate holder of the bill of lading has brought a claim against the owners under the bill of lading in circumstances where he wouldn't have had recourse to his, uh, to his seller because probably he has bought on terms that say a quality of the goods are, were final at load. And he is able to advance that claim under the Bill of Lading against the owners, even because the, the vessel is in um, a, a jurisdiction where the courts will essentially entertain that, that claim. And the ship is there. And as we know, the ship is stuck. Um, so this is, this is kind of a circular claim because the claim will be advised and advanced under the bill of lading owners recover from um, the uh, voyage charters and then I'd say it would be right that the as a SIF seller you can recover from your buyer for his failures at the at the discharge port to arrange uh, discharge. Uh, other types of damage well we have we have the next one is damage to the vessel. Well, clearly there, we anyone, if we look at, for example, a claim for uh, hull fouling, so where the vessel is in one place for so long that the that barnacles grow on the bottom of the of the ship, they reduce the ship's speed and consumption, then um, plainly to anyone involved in shipping, that is a directly and naturally occurring result of the breach. Whether that's 
reasonably foreseeable. And I think uh, Robert was going to touch on some parts of this also in his um, presentation. Is, is what is reasonably foreseeable to a, a trader in one part of the world as the natural result of delay in a port in another part of the world uh, reasonably foreseeable is, is another question. Um, and I think, I think there's still a lot to be discussed there. Now we're at time. So the, the only thing I just wanted to add was a very slight commercial gloss on this, which is what is the, what's going to be the reaction of the market to this? What's, what's my reaction going to be as a commercial lawyer if this comes across my desk? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is check whether I'm actually at risk. I'm gonna check how many contracts we have where I'm at the end of a voyage charter party chain and I'm an FOB buyer or a SIF seller. And then I'm going to consider on the basis of that level of risk, whether it's worth drafting a, a bespoke clause to get out of it. Um, and whether that then is going to be effective depends, of course, on market conditions. What's the strength of the market? Which, which party is holding the cards? It also depends on the skill of my um, trader in negotiating. Most often, most often of all, it depends, frankly, on whether the counterparty has read the contract um, as to whether I'm going to get that agreed. I'm going to stop there. I just wanted to put that slight commercial gloss on the end and um, hand back to um, Sir Richard. Thank you very much indeed, Anne. Uh, it is always correct, isn't it, that at the end of all this, we're dealing with uh, how it affects the market and uh, what are going to be the commercial reactions uh, of the various parties involved, whether they're ship owners, charterers, or commodity traders, one way or another. And it's perhaps in, in that context uh, that I want to deal with the, with the first question that's been raised, um, because it, it really looks at how far uh, Mr. Justice Andrew Baker's judgment might go. So this assumes that he's correct. And uh, the question is, does demurrage also compensate for additional port charges incurred during the period of detention? And two, the consequences of marine fouling that grows on the hull during the period of detention, the time and expense involved to inspect and clean the hull, and any underperformance claims that may arise before the cleaning can be done. Topics that Anne touched on uh, at the end of her uh, presentation. So um, what does the panel think of this? Chris, uh, would you like to take a lead on that? I, I'm very happy to take a lead on this. And as you say, it's a question that Anne uh, touched on and Robert would have touched on it, certainly on one of his slides. And I, I'm going to revert to a theme from my presentation, which is that I think the starting point must be the wording of the particular provision one is looking at. And if one is looking at the provision in the eternal bliss, you are trying to identify whether any time has been lost and the claim is in respect of the time lost. Now, in my view, um, if one is looking at port costs, they are part and parcel of the ordinary profit and loss account that applies while the vessel's in port, and that therefore a claim for port loss is a claim for part and parcel of the time lost. So assuming Mr Justice Andrew Baker is correct, that claim does not fly. Uh, on the other hand, a claim for damage to the hull, and that's essentially what marine growth is, is separate because the time that the owner loses as a result of the uh, hull fouling either is in the delay of another voyage or in the time taken to remove the growth. And in my view, that is a separate loss and that claim is permitted. And if I can give one third example that Robert and I had a discussion about the other day, if you had a prospectively safe port so one that the charter was entitled to nominate, that because of his delay in discharging became unsafe, causing damage to the vessel. Take those old Shat al-Arab cases. So a vessel is, um, suffers a, a bombing strike uh, 
while she's in port, but she would not have done if there had not been a delay, subject to any questions of foreseeability. I don't think anybody is going to say that that is covered by the provisions of the demurrage clause. So I think it is a matter of um, how far one goes, and I think it is a matter of what really falls outside the phrase any time lost. Thank you very much. There is another question. And so I'm going to take that question and then uh, we may come back to others to comment on this uh, first question further, because it does raise some very interesting points. But this is a, a broader question that's uh, come uh, from George Theocharadis, Charadis, I beg your pardon, George. Um, and it's interesting because it comes from somebody who, as he says, is from a continental jurisdiction. So he asks, prima facie, it's a matter of construction of the wording of the clauses, but my understanding is that demurrage is liquidated damages agreed between owner charter for the breach flowing from the inability to earn income from the vessel for the period that it was detained outside the agreed free period, free in inverted commas. That is one breach. Now, if the cargo was damaged during that period, I think the question is, who has caused the loss? That is, what is the adequate cause? which led to the loss. If that's attributed to the charterer, then the latter should be liable. That would have to be so because it would be a distinct breach. If we approach the matter this way, then there's no need to examine if the breach of the lay time obligations encompasses other damages. Could such reasoning be plausible under English law? Well, um, now, um, I think Daryl, you uh, have volunteered to have a crack at that one, first of all. Okay, I think uh, as a matter of English law, you have to establish a duty, a breach of that duty, damage, uh, which is causally linked to the breach of that duty. Uh, and here, uh, I think the continental approach seems to start with causation rather than a breach of duty and the damage. So here, there is only one breach. There is cargo damage. Uh, the damage flows from the breach, the question is, in the eternal bliss, whether the demurrage provision liquidates that damage as well as the damages for loss of the use of the vessel as a freight earning asset. So I think that's the way we would approach it as English lawyers. Thank you very much indeed, Daryl. Now, I, I can't uh, resist moving on to this next question before any other comments on questions number one and two, uh, because it, it's... Uh, demonstrates that uh, we have got a very uh, wide audience, which includes the judge himself, Mr. Justice Andrew Baker has asked a question. And he says, irrespective of whether I got the answer right, and with respect, we're not here to say yay or nay on that, that's for the Court of Appeal. Does the panel think it was a good use by the parties of the preliminary issue procedure under the 1996 Act? Well, does anyone have a, a view on that that they would like to express? I haven't asked any particular panelists, uh, but um, uh, as if, uh, if anyone would like to express a view, then please go ahead. Well, as one of the parties involved, I'm bound to say yes, I do. Um, but I think, I think actually it's a very good advert for London. Uh, Nick Austin, uh, Reed Smith and I discussed after submissions whether we would take it straight to the High Court and agreed that that was a sensible thing to do. Uh, it would have saved costs of an extra round of argument. Um, and uh, so I think it was absolutely the right thing to do. Does any one of the panelists have a contrary view? I suppose it would be like Turkey is voting for Christmas if they did, apart perhaps from somebody who was an arbitrator who wasn't going to argue it in, in court. Uh, but I think amongst the, uh, the barristers and solicitors, it's more, more work and therefore a good thing. If I may, Sir Richard, as an arbitrator, it seems to me that it was a very good use of the procedure, partly because it is a long disputed and doubted question, and it's much better way of getting a clear answer as distinct from having a judge consider whether this is within the margin of appreciation of an arbitrator that it might be okay to say this. This way we get a straight answer to the question 
whether rather than an answer to the question whether there's a fault in an award. Or not arguably uh, wrong or something like that. Uh, my only quibble is that there were two questions of law that were posed and the second one concerned the, the possible right to an indemnity in respect of the consequences of complying with the Charter's orders to load, carry and discharge the cargo. Uh, and uh, in the end, the judge decided uh, not to answer that question. Well, uh, the, the difficulty is that even if uh, the answer to the first question is, no, you can't get anything more than demurrage, by the Court of Appeal or the, the Supreme Court, you've still got something left, haven't you, for the arbitrators to deal with. And that itself may then raise a, a point of law which is of sufficient importance for it to go to court. But let's leave it there because there are... Let's leave it there because there are other questions uh, that, that have been posed after uh, Mr. Justice Andrew Baker's question. So, would the commodity world escape from the complications of demurrage detention in carriage through the simple device of calling the clause in a sale contract what it actually is? Liquidated damages clause at load or disport rather than calling it a demurrage clause. Well, that's a very good question. Anne, what do you think of that? And are you there? Oh, yes, I am. I am here. <laughs> well, yes, clearly that that I think that uh, terminology would uh, put it beyond uh, dispute. Uh, though whether we'd all have as much fun on evenings like this would be uh, debatable. I, th I think ultimately this is a question of construction, and of course the parties are free to amend their bargain. Uh, and they could put a clause in a charter party on a sale contract saying demurrage in this contract means, and then they can either jump the potter or the baker away, if I could be so blunt. <laughs> it's, it's a matter for them. Indeed. Yes, yes, it, it must be a matter for them. And indeed, uh, another anonymous attendee uh, makes the comment, it is always open for parties to seek to limit their liabilities. I recall BP 2015 is an example of one that would seek to limit any delays in loading or discharge to demurrage. And I suppose that could have been done here in this particular case, could it not? Chris, what do you think? Well, I, I think to, to go back to something Anne said, if the parties chose to attach a particular label, um, lay time or demurrage, um, you would still have the issue raised by the, the passages from McGregor that I mentioned. You could call it liquidated damages instead of demurrage, but you would still have to look at whether as a matter of construction, the loss that had happened arising out of the breach that had happened was covered by the clause in question. So I, I still think it comes down to looking at the particular provision in the particular contract. Uh, I... I uh, yes, I suppose I, it depends how clearly in your contract you say it. If you say demurrage in this contract means liquidated damages for loss of use of the vessel as a freight earning asset, then you're squarely, you know, there and, it, and, and you could come up with a formal wording that points the debate the other way. Or, or um, if you could stick with the word demurrage and say uh, demurrage is your liquidated damage for any consequences of a breach of the obligation to load in time. Exactly. Um, uh, and that would make it clear that way. Yep. Rather than any time lost as a result of the breach of that obligation. So one could clarify it either way. Yeah. So this comes back to the point that demurrage is a term of art as a legal term rather than a, if you like, commercial term. And therefore, it ought to be more clearly defined in the contracts which is interesting because in a sense it, it brings in the other part of Swiss Atlantique, doesn't it? Um, is a demurrage clause um, an exclusion or a limitation of liability clause as well? 
Uh, and uh, if you define it in a particular way by using rather more extended wording in a charter party or indeed a, a commodity contract, uh, then you could avoid that issue. And I think, isn't that the point that's being made by Jeffrey Blum uh, in his comment uh, that um, the commodity traders ought to understand more about the consequences of their commercial clauses than they may misunderstand from their interpretation of charter parties, thereby leading to more disputes. Well, that, that's a, perhaps a slightly harsh comment. And do you think that uh, that's fair on uh, the, um, the commodity traders or not? Look, for, for the most part, it's entirely fair, right? There are most, um, the, these are issues which are largely outside the contemplation of your average trader for the vast majority of the time. And the, the question as to whether they need to worry about it is really, they would say, well, look, what's my risk if I don't? If I trade on terms that 90% of the time it turns out absolutely fine, then I need to quantify my risk about what that 10% is. And, and really the, the role of us as a commercial lawyer is to try and identify though that small category of, of instances where actually understanding what the law says is really going to make a material difference. Um, but but I'm, I'm somewhat in favour of an approach which doesn't necessarily import wholesale uh, charter party concepts into sale of goods con contracts, just for that reason that, that I think it possibly reduces confusion. If, if you don't. The problem, I suppose, is a kind of inertia in uh, the well-established commodity trades to move away from something which has been in the contract and is supposedly understood uh, and, and has been there for 50, 100 years or more even. We all know that these uh, standard types of clause uh, arose in the mid 19th century out of the commodity trades, often based up in Manchester and Liverpool at the time. Uh, and um, some of them haven't changed very much, have they? Now, there's another uh, question or, or comment perhaps, uh, but it, it gives rise to some, uh, uh, to some um, food for thought. Assuming a separate detention clause would be agreed to, would you then use the demurrage rate as the reference? I suppose it's both would you or could you? Now, Robert, uh, what do you think to that one? Sorry, I'm not quite sure I understand it, but I think part of the answer is as a matter of law, the demurrage provision only applies within the loading and discharge stages. And there have been cases in which charters have caused delay after completion of loading or before the vessel's able to give a notice of readiness at discharge. And technically, in those cases, damages for detention are at large and the owners can recover their real losses. Though very frequently in practice, people agree to recover the demurrage rate. Basically, that means that the owners are probably recovering a bit less than their real losses. But on the other hand, they don't have to prove what their real losses are. And some owners are not that keen on opening their books to some charterers to show what their real costs have been. I'm not sure whether that's an answer, but... Well, I, I, I think it is, but, but you, you must be right. Damages for detention outside lay days demurrage are at large. Um, if you were to define a clause sufficiently well in a charter, uh, then presumably you could also uh, have a limitation on those uh, damages uh, by express terms as well. Now, there's another question uh, from uh, Mr. Chu, 
Uh, is there any room after the decision of the eternal bliss for an implied term in a bill of lading incorporating a voyage charter that a shipper or receiver undertakes to load or discharge a cargo within a reasonable time? And if so, would the lay days be considered a reasonable time? Well, perhaps I ought to go on this one as, as I've been partly responsible for writing a book on bills of lading. I think it's going to be difficult to say that uh, uh, unless there was some um, absolutely express incorporation that you could say that, for example, receivers um, uh, under bills of lading are going to be uh, liable for uh, even demurrage, let alone something else. There's a, a decision of the House of Lords called the Miramar. Uh, which confirmed the decisions of the courts below, pouring scorn on the idea uh, that, that, that uh, parties to bills of lading could be responsible uh, for demurrage. So I think it would be very difficult. In theory, of course, one can construct anything uh, in a contract, unless it's illegal, uh, to bind parties. But I think the answer is probably very unlikely. Now, we're, we're moving, uh, I, I must apologize to Mr. Bloom for mispronouncing his name. Many uh, uh, apologies. Um, but before uh, that, there's another question. Um, the, the query, this is to you, Anne, whether voyage charters would be live, able to pass on the claim down the sales contract. Would the landmark uh, Supreme Court decision on vicarious liability, Global Santosh, um, NYK against Cargill, be relevant for determining whether the demurrage claim can be passed down the sales contract claim. And do you have um, any thoughts on that one? And other panelists might like to be thinking about it as well. That's an extremely interesting question, um, but frankly, one that I would need much more time to consider. It's not something I considered while I was uh, preparing this uh, this presentation. Um, I, I can see why the question's raised and I'm not going to venture any more of an opinion than that before I actually have a chance to think about it. That's very wise. Um, any other panelists uh, like to stick their neck out with a thought on this? I'll, I'll stick my neck out a little way. I think one interesting point that arises out of this question is that is if one is looking at whether one can pass that liability down the line to, to the receiver, one then ends up in a position where if the receiver um, could, could be held liable um, to their contractual counterparts, query the basis upon which the owner was ever liable to the receiver in the first place. So if ultimately the, the fault lies with the receiver, um, uh, uh, and that's a liability that can be established against them, then it's probably quite unlikely that the owner would ever be able to settle with them on terms that they could then say were reasonable for the purposes of recovery action against the charterer. So I think that the, the chain is broken at, at, at that level if you are into a situation where the actual receiver is actually at fault. Chris, I think that's reasonable if you're assuming something like English law applying throughout, but the eternal bliss, it's a fact that discharge was in China, and without making any Trump-like comments, it's well known that in certain countries, the first and last rule with regard to cargo claims is the ship is liable. Well, th then you get into, I, I think if one pick, picks a different port, I, I've seen it referred to, I think in one of the cases, it may have been the Costas Mellis, the Aqaba factor. Um, so there are other places where you may inevitably be getting these delays, but then one is going to have to look at questions of foreseeability. And, and again, you know, genuinely whether the, uh, it would be uh, re reasonably foreseeable that an owner paid a claim to a receiver that they felt obligated through commercial necessity to pay, but were not under any legal obligation to pay. Well, thank you. Uh, th there are two more questions that have been posed. We uh, may have time to look at, at both of them, but let's certainly look at this first one, um, because it uh, 
raises again this question of whether or not you can somehow uh, either limit who's going to be involved or spread the load of who's going to be involved. Uh, as the questioner points out, uh, breach of the charter is a matter of liability between owner and charterers, and since issues occur that connect the traders, do you foresee a new clause added by which I think the questioner means added to the charter party that makes clear that whatever has to do with the commodity other than carrier's fault should be solved between the traders as well. Well, one of the difficulties would be, uh, would third parties be bound by that? Um, but uh, Daryl, have you got any thoughts on that? Well, if you could get the commodity trader to agree a term in the charter party, whereby it steps in and assumes responsibility, uh, then yes, and you do see that in relation to cargo shortage claims, um, but you don't often see it in relation to any other types of claims. And I suspect Anne will come back and say that, generally speaking, her job will tell the commodity traders not to agree those clauses. Is that so, Anne? Uh, yes. <laughs> Um, though I wonder what is 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 meant here is is it the suggestion that the the voyage charter should expressly exclude his liability for these kind of claims as against the owner in these circumstances? Well, I'm I'm not prepared. Uh, though I may be reading that the other way around. Yeah, the, the the questioner. But I, as I say, I had assumed that this is a clause in in the charter but it, it yeah. would, it's, it's no good just resting there is it it's got to go down the chain if it's going to have any uh, efficacy mm -hmm. and what would it be in the form of some kind of indemnity uh, perhaps for any liability um, that that's uh, that uh, f for example if, if you if you have the sh the, um, the shipper charterer um, then selling on um, and the shipper charter is going to be liable um, for this type of damage, then there would somehow have to be a, a, an indemnity clause provision, wouldn't there, or something along those lines? In the sale contract, yes. Yeah, so uh, who's, who's going to volunteer for that? No one is going to volunteer for that. Um, you, you, you'd suddenly start getting insurance issues and so on and so on, wouldn't you? So. Mm -hmm. uh, is that perhaps not a not a runner? Mm. And in particular, as Anne said, the receiver is attacking the ship partly because the ship is there, but partly also because his seller is very likely protected by some sort of certificate final clause. Yeah. Yes. Now this last. Um, comment uh, question um, deals with some interesting practicalities, particularly in relation to the type of cargo involved here, soya beans, uh, the type of voyage that was involved here uh, from um, South America to China. Uh, and um, the point is made that often this type of cargo ar arrives um, in a poor condition anyway. So is the liability of the ship owner to the receiver something which is caused by the detention at the discharge port or is it caused by something else? Now here, that it's been an assumed fact that there was a liability uh, to the receivers. It was something for which the owners were responsible, at least to such an extent that it was reasonable to compromise the claim. But what if the, if the position in fact was that the, um, uh, the, the, the sole cause of the loss was nothing to do with the detention. Well, not the sole cause, but the main cause of the loss was nothing to do with the detention. Then what, what happens then? Well, anyone want to, to, to have one or two sentences on that? And then I think we're going to have to uh, wrap up. 
um, I, I suspect that the answer is that what happens then is one gets into incredibly complicated causation issues relating to um, inherent vice and the ability of your cargo to withstand the ordinary rigours of the voyage, and one then has to dip into the decision in Volcaf and um, open up all sorts of other issues. Maybe that'll be eternal bliss mark two, who knows? Well, I was looking at the the, um, the uh, agreed findings or the, the assumed facts, and one of the findings or, or assumed facts was that the condition of the cargo deteriorated as a result of the detention beyond the lay time. Now, I don't know anything about the facts of your case, Daryl, but I suspect that that assumption of itself is going to be incredibly difficult to prove at some stage, and uh, that you know that there may well be um, inherent vice and ability to withstand the voyage issues lurking in the background. Well, that, that is the, precisely the point that's been made by that questioner. Well, I'm going to thank all those who have posed questions or made comments because that meant that this has given people some food, whether it be soya beans or something else, for thought. And I want to thank all our panelists this evening for their uh, brilliantly concise presentations uh, and the clear slides, and indeed to thank uh, the organizers uh, for this evening. So many thanks to you all. And if other people have questions, doubtless they uh, can be put up to the panelists and the panelists can think about them at their leisure uh, and possibly answer them. Anyway, that's enough from me. Thank you all very much indeed for joining us. Thank you to all those involved. I believe it now uh, falls upon me to express my thanks uh, to Sir Richard once again for carrying out his work far and above the, what might be called the call of duty. I think what he's done is really quite something, quite exceptional uh, without chairman like himself. I'm not, not quite sure where the, the center would be. I'm so pleased to see that this evening's webinar has held up the standards that the center has been able to achieve and maintain over the past 26 years or so. It's a, and it is such a pleasure to be part um, of an organization um, of this nature. Finally, I'd just like to remind all those who participated all the, all the people who tuned in, and thank you so much, that the next webinar is on the 21st of April on the exciting topic of decarbonization. And I hope we all will be part of that uh, on the 21st of April. Thank you so much uh, to all of you. Thank you and uh, good night.